Unlike the empirical sciences, which necessarily presuppose certain assumptions about the way the world works, such as that our sensory perception is reliable, or that there really are natural causes to the events taking place around us, philosophy is supposed to have no assumptions, for it intends to analyse the assumptions that we might make before engaging in something like physical science itself. For example, in his Critique of Pure Reason, Immanuel Kant set out to dispose the assumptions that space and time were really out there in the world, and that they weren't just forms that the mind transposes onto some transcendent reality that we cannot directly experience, so that we may experience something like it. Kant's work is not science, so science itself cannot address or critique Kant, for Kant was investigating what is presupposed for science altogether. When it comes to philosophy, however, we take the position that our endeavours are purely rational, that there are no pre-philosophical assumptions that are presupposed for any philosophy to be possible. However, this assumption, while very common, is false. There are such pre-philosophical assumptions, and we call these the laws of thought. These laws are considered to be the fundamental axiomatic rules upon which all rational discourse is based and they are taken to be the laws that underlie the thoughts of all conscious beings. They are called laws because they apply without exception to any and all subject matters. They are the objects of logic itself. There are three such laws, and they are the law of identity, the law of contradiction, and the law of excluded middle. The law of identity states whatever is, is. For any proposition A, A equals A. The law of non-contradiction states Nothing can both be and not be. Two or more contradictory theories cannot be true at the same time. The law of excluded middle states Everything must either be or not be. Sounds pretty reasonable for sure. But while they all appear as common sense, this story is not yet complete. A self-referential paradox occurs when a statement refers to itself in such a way that the reference leads back to the starting point. The oldest and most simple example of this is the case where Socrates states, All that I know is that I know nothing. If Socrates does indeed know that he knows nothing, then he knows something. But he can only know something if he does indeed know nothing. Therefore, Socrates does and does not know nothing. The most complete modern formulation of this paradox is Russell's paradox, discovered by Bertrand Russell in 1901. Russell's paradox concerns Gottlob Frege's foundation of mathematics and utilises formal set theory. There is a particular instantiation of this paradox called the Grelling-Nelson paradox, which is informal and semantic. We will discuss this version of the paradox since it is simpler to understand. The paradox goes like this. The word homological describes words that describe themselves, small, unhyphenated, English, etc. And the word heterological describes words that do not describe themselves, big, hyphenated, French, etc. As we've discussed, the law of excluded middle, that everything must either be or not be, necessitates that each and every word either describe itself or not describe itself. The paradox occurs when we attempt to categorise the word heterological. If we assert that this word is homological, that is, it describes itself, then we are led to the conclusion that it is heterological, which is a contradiction. But if we now conclude that the word heterological is heterological, that is, does not describe itself, then it cannot be heterological and must be homological. Either way, we are led to a contradiction and must conclude that the word heterological neither describes nor does not describe itself. Yet, the law of the excluded middle, a fundamental law of logic, tells us that it must either describe itself or not. So what is it? We are led to two options. First, we have somehow misdefined the word heterological. And second, that the law of excluded middle is false. You will find that it is impossible to make an argument for the former, so we must conclude that the law of excluded middle is indeed false. We have just broken philosophy. But surely this cannot be right. For if we decide to make this conclusion for one object of logic, 
we must make the conclusion for the whole of philosophy itself. And we know for sure that most true statements do indeed follow the law of excluded middle. And so the law of excluded middle cannot be false after all. Hence the paradox. There is another interesting consideration here that eliminates yet another law of logic. This arises when we attempt to categorize the word homological. If we assert that this word is homological, that it describes itself, then it describes itself. Great. But if we then asserted that the word homological is heterological, that it does not describe itself, then it does not describe itself. It seems we are able to categorize the word homological as both homological and heterological without contradiction. But this contradicts the law of contradiction, which states that nothing can both be and not be. One might now think that it could be logical that we create a new way to define words that includes not just words that do or do not describe themselves, but also words that both describe and do not describe themselves, and words that both neither describe nor do not describe themselves. But this system would be useless, especially for mathematical systems, for it could not possibly give us any way to analyse statements logically. But perhaps we could propose that there might be some higher system which describes things that are beyond the purview of logical thinking altogether, some paralogic that is completely separate to formal logic, and which describes logical thought itself, but not the contents of logical thought, mathematics and semantics. Yet, this would now imply that some aspects of philosophy are transcendent, which is to say that there is some subject beyond normal philosophy which is non-rational and non-computational. This could pose a problem for traditional theories of the natural world. Let me know in the comments section how you think these paradox could be resolved, and subscribe to hear a follow-up of this video.